Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast and happy 2024. Wow, I can't believe that we are at the beginning of a new year. For the first 10 episodes in 2024, we are going to take a look back at the top 10 episodes of 2023. These were high value, high impact episodes that I really felt needed to be replayed and reshared. So sit back and enjoy this top 10 episode. Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And you are in for a very wonderful surprise today. If you have been looking to increase your sales, sell less products for more money to better clientele, then you are going to want to listen to today's episode of the Author to Authority podcast. Today I have with me Craig Andrews, and he is the principal ally and founder of the marketing agency called Allies for Me. And he uses a proven method that mimics the stages of courtship, and he helps companies find strangers and convert them into high-paying customers. And he has learned that there is this eight-stage customer value journey, and that's the framework that leads someone from first contact to post-purchase. So, Craig, welcome to the show, and I'm excited for today's conversation. Kim, it's a delight to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about we, – we were talking before we hit record, and it was so energizing. I can't wait to hear what happens after hitting record. So, Craig, this is your first time on the Author to Authority podcast, but I suspect not the last. And what I would love for you to do is just take a, you know, a, f- a few minutes, um, just introduce yourself, share a bit of your business story. You know, how did you start the marketing agency? You know, what have been some of the ups and downs? And just share a bit from the heart and and then we'll get into the real meat. But I always love for um, the audience to get to know you a little bit first. Yeah, you know, my path here has been anything but a straight line. You know, (laughs) Um, I I graduated high school with a GPA so low that I couldn't get into any university that anybody's ever heard of. So I went in the Marine Corps for six years, had a really good recruiter. First great salesperson I met got me to sign up for six years, six wonderful years. And uh, when I got out, I thought, um, I, um, I, I want to build things. I want to create things. And so I applied to engineering school, by the way, I applied to university from a Japanese post office. I was living in Japan at the time. And, uh, and I get back to the States, I get a bachelor's degree in engineering. I get a master's degree in engineering. And then I realize I'm like, Oh, this is not the place to be creative. Um, I learned the hard way, the expensive way. Uh, that homework was hard and it was long. And, uh, and so I, was in, I, was, I actually had a great job. I was a design engineer, which not all engineers are. And I was designing cell phones in the 90s when, when those were new and cool things. And, uh, but something was missing. And so I thought, well, let me try marketing. And so I started marketing semiconductors. <laughs> okay, okay, Greg, I, I just got to stop you right there. So you you are an engineer. You want something more creative. Why would you pick marketing? Well, that was I don't know. That was the only path that was I, that was in front of me. And um, I thought, how do I take what I have and apply it slightly differently? But it it's I don't know. I mean, at least my experience <laughs> has been that I get to do I get to be creative. You know, eighty percent of the time. Mm, uh, true. Whereas in engineering, I was creative maybe 5% of the time on a good day. And, and so that's, and that's why I did. And, and, and so I marketed chips for mobile phones. I uh, was in, visited all the top, the world's top mobile phone makers. It's a, it's a different mix now than it was then. The, the two that I visited back then, they're still in the top five now are Samsung and Apple. And, um, but one of the things that 
was happening. It was you know very competitive industry. Whenever you're in that type of volume, uh, the price pressure, the margin pressure is insane. Mm -hmm. And I knew the day was going to come when they asked me to fly coach to Asia. And I said, when that day come, comes, I'm done because I used to go to Asia four or five times a year. And sure enough, that came around and I was like, all right, time to move on, do something different. Mm -hmm. And I'd been pretty good at marketing chips for mobile phones. I thought, well, I'll just go spread my wealth of knowledge to the, to the rest of the world, you know, mm -hmm. regular industry. And, and it's funny when I run into some of my former colleagues in the semiconductor world, they ask me what I've been doing. And I tell them I've, I've been spending the last 10 years learning how little about marketing I actually know. Uh, it's been a, it's been an amazing journey. I mean, it's been fun. It's been exciting. It was obviously humbling. And, uh, but you know, one day, uh, originally I was trying to make some type of online product that would help market, market mm -hmm. people's businesses that failed. And I was having lunch with somebody one day and they said, uh, started asking me some questions and say, Hey, can I pay you to do this stuff for me? I'm like, Oh, that feels good. And so, that's, <laughs> and so that's kind of how I got my start. Now, Craig, before, uh, before the show, you were telling me about a really hard time um, personally for both you and your wife. And I would love to share for you to share about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the pandemic impacted a lot of people, some, uh, higher degrees, um, you know, we'd probably be in the higher degree. Obviously, there are those that were impacted even more than my wife and I. But August 10th of 2021, I walked into the hospital and walked up to the ER desk and said, I am having trouble breathing. And they immediately brought me back, put me on oxygen. And um, 11 days later, they came in, they, uh, they said, Hey, we're going to give you something to help you sleep tonight, which was good because nights were horrible. And, and I was like, well, that sounds good. I wish I'd have asked what they were going to give me. Turns mm -hmm. out they shot me full of morphine and which suppresses respiration. And several hours later, they called my wife and asked for permission to put me on the ventilator. And she asked, she heard me screaming in the background of shouting, no ventilator, no ventilator, because we both knew if I went on the ventilator, I was going to die because this was Delta variant. Everybody that went on the ventilator died. Yeah. And, um, and she asked the doc, she said, well, he doesn't want to go on. And he said, well, he'll be dead in 24 hours if you don't put him on the ventilator. And she said, well, what if I do put him on the ventilator? Well, he's also going to die. And so it was that situation in the middle of the night, she had to make this choice. And, um, and I woke up six weeks later and something really fascinating happened during those six weeks. Uh, my trust in the doctors had plummeted. It went through the floor. Mm. But my trust in my wife had skyrocketed. It was through the roof. And it's bizarre because it was lights out for me. But the difference is my, you know, the first thing they told my wife was you can't, you know, visit him. And she said, well, if he's going to die, he's not going to die alone. They said, well, no, you can't visit him. And she said, well, I really insist. And fortunately she was persuasive. And so they gave her an hour a day and she came in one hour every day and she would sing to me. She would pray over me and she would say words of encouragement. And I've actually repeated back to her word for word things that she told me in my coma. And okay, so, so let's stop there for a sec. So, so did she chose not to put you on the ventilator, right? No, she chose to put me on the ventilator. You know, it was just okay. it was a tough choice. Mm -hmm. It was such a hard choice when when I woke up and she started filling me in on what happened. You know, the first feeling I had was just profound sadness for. Mm -hmm her having to make such a difficult choice alone yeah. in the middle of the night. Yeah. So, so after you were on the ventilator, so did you like, was this, did you just fall into a coma? Did they put you in a coma? Like what kind of happened there? 
Yeah, well, the, the morphine mostly knocked me out, but apparently, yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit of a fighter. Anybody that knows me knows that. And apparently I still had enough fight in me, even full morphine, to say no ventilator, no ventilator. <laughs> but um, they, uh, you know, they, um, you know, they shot me up full of drugs that just kind of put me out. And, mm -hmm. and during those six weeks, uh, I had a series of dreams and those mm -hmm. dreams were my reality so much so that when i woke up i believed those things really happened mm. and the um the way i would describe the dreams closer to is think of it as a continuum close to the beginning when i when it all started those dreams were greatly divorced from reality on the other side right before i, I was alert and awake those dreams were a lot closer to reality everything in between was a representation of reality, but just through a different filter. Mm. And so um, the, you know, some of the words I repeated back to my wife, um, in my world, I was in some sleazy resort in Louisiana. Um, uh, it's kind of a bizarre dream. I really believed it. You know, and and uh, a week or two after I woke up and I started realizing that um, some of the things I believed about the world were not true, um, I called my wife over and I said, hey, I, I need to tell you some things and I want you to tell me if these things really happened. And that was one of the first ones I tried mm -hmm. it out was, have we been in a resort in Louisiana? And she said, no. And I told her, you know, what my view of the world was and I got to this point where she, um, they, um, it, so I knew I was, I knew I'd been sick I, that they, mm -hmm. I knew I was at the resort to recover and convalesce. And, uh, one of the bizarre things was the resort had a weird selection of, uh, uh, uh room service mm -hmm. and the room service of my preference was, uh, young ladies would come in and spray raw cow's milk at my face. And, and it would make me feel better. <laughs> and uh, and the time came, the time came for me to leave. And they started saying, "Mr. Andrews, you need to leave. You need to leave." And um, and I said, "Well, I can't move. You'll have to come in and get me." And they started getting more and more angry. And uh, they said, "If you don't leave, we're going to tell your wife about your room service." I said, you can tell her. She knows I like raw cow's milk. There's no secrets there. Um, and, uh, and by the way, I've never had raw cow's milk in my life. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so then they, uh, then I heard them mumbling and they, they said, let's get his wife. And all of a sudden, Karen came over and she touched my left shoulder and she said, Craig, this is Karen. I'm your wife. It's going to be okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, at that time, um, several times a day, respiratory therapists would come into my room, usually young ladies, and they would put a mask of nebulized albuterol on my face. Mm. So my brain just translated that into raw milk, uh, which made me feel better. But <laughs> it just, so that that was kind of my that was kind of my state when I was out, um, mm -hmm. and you know when I when I woke up, um, I believed I lived in a different house. I had completely forgotten about my house of eighteen years, mm -hmm. and my brother and his wife had come down to watch me when when my wife was at work, and and one day my brother was making conversation. And this was at the point when I could talk. I could, you know, for about my first week, week and a half awake, I couldn't talk. I still had a trach in my throat. Uh, but at this point, I could talk. And my brother said something about the last trip to my house. And in my mind, he had never visited my house because I lived in a completely different house. It turns out to be a fictitious house. But at that point, I'd seen enough events where something that I believed to be true. Mm -hmm. Everybody around me didn't believe it to be true. And it scared me because I thought I'd lost grip with reality. Mm -hmm. And so I thought if they figure out that I've lost grip with reality, they're going to take away privileges. 
And so I asked my brother, I said, well, tell me, tell me about your last visit. When were you there? And he, he, he said, well, I was there last month when you were on the ventilator. I said, well, tell me, what, what did you do? And what I was doing was I was getting him to describe my house to me. And gradually as he talked, I started remembering my house of 18 years. And, um, and I started putting the pieces back together. Mm-hmm. And it was like a day or two later that I called my wife over and said, hey, I, I need you to tell me what's real and what's not. Yeah. yeah. Well, you they did have you on like some pretty heavy duty narcotics there. So I'm not surprised that reality shifted for you a little bit. But um, I want to get to the training section, but can you just take about a minute or so and and just share kind of what happened after that? Like, how did you get back on your feet? How long did it take you to recover? Were you able to step back into your business again? What did that look like? Well, the first thing I want to do is I just um, want to compliment my team. You know, as I was waking up and my wife, you know, started telling me about what had been going on in work my team stepped up and ran the business without me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not only that, you know, some 1099s reached out to my team and said, as long as Craig's in the hospital, we will do whatever you need. And it was amazing. Um, The, uh, so I got out of the hospital November 6th. Uh, I'd walked, you know, a half dozen times or so. You know, I didn't walk until October 20th seventh. That was the first time I walked. And when I left the hospital, I was still in a wheelchair, was in a wheelchair for about three months after the hospital, um, building up my strength so I could walk further and further. I was on oxygen. Uh, So I took the rest of the year off and I returned to work uh, January 3rd of 2022. And, and that had to be very moderated. You know, so I'd work for a couple hours and I'd take a rest work a couple more hours and take a rest. And, you know, last, uh, last year was really just, uh, rebuilding mm-hmm. back. And, um, and, you know, I had some, uh, clients come visit me in the hospital, which was amazing. Um, but it's, you know, one of the things tying back to those six weeks I was out, that was really interesting. The, you yeah, know, I mentioned my trust in the doctors dropped and my trust in, mm-hmm. And my wife went through the roof. You know, it reminded me of this Maya Angelou quote that people will forget what you said. They will forget what you do, did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. And the way the doctors made me feel was the polar opposite of the way my wife made me feel. Even when I thought I was in a resort in Louisiana being sprayed with raw cow's milk. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think we could probably go on with that story for quite a while there, Greg, Craig, and I think we'll have you back, but let's shift gears a little bit here. I know you've come prepared today to talk about, you know, how do you shorten that sales cycle, especially when you sell high ticket uh, products and services. So I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit, and then I'll ask you some questions. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, I think the way we do high ticket sales is broken. Mm. You know, and I would liken it to walking into a bar, seeing someone cute on the other side of the bar and walking up saying, Hey, you're kind of cute. May I have your phone number. What the heck? Let's just get married or something else. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I don't know, maybe the kids are doing it differently these days, but at least when I was, you know, uh, Coming up, that was that was considered inappropriate, <laughs> and, <laughs> and but for and, girls, and some, fathers would be coming after you at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, and the um, and so we generally tend not to do that in personal relationships, but for some reason, when it comes to high ticket sales, that's exactly the model we follow. You know, we find somebody, we see a prospect. Oh, they've got, you know, they've got good revenue. They're a good size. And we go up and say, you're kind of cute. Would you like to sign up for my five, six, seven figure program or a product or service or whatever it is? And uh, we think there should be a coffee date. And we, we put that in the form of what we call an irresistible first time offer. It's like a mini project that 
helps them solve a problem. And that's really important. It has to help them solve a problem. But the, the idea is just like a coffee date, you know, the, when you show up, when you meet somebody, you don't ask them to marry you. You, you say, Hey, you know, there may be something here. Why don't we meet for coffee? And both people drive there separately. You know, what the ladies tell me is their girlfriends, they have a girlfriend that will call in in about 15 or 20 minutes to see if they need a rescue. You, know, you take all the risk out, you take the commitment risk out and you go because you hope it leads to something bigger, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it ends at the coffee date. And we believe that's what the sales cycle needs. If you're selling high ticket items, especially in this economy, you know, people are just, they're scared. They're conserving cash. They're afraid to make a step that they can't reverse. And so what we do is we come in with um, it's and here are the basic qualifiers of it. It has to be an impulse purchase. And that means the coins in the cushion, your couch, the money in your wallet or the B2B equivalent of that. In other words, if whoever you're presenting it to has to ask anybody for permission to spend that money, it's priced too high. It has to be an amount of money that somebody can spend and will never be held accountable for how that money was spent. The second thing is it has to deliver a disproportionate amount of value to pr uh, price. And we usually aim for 10x the value. We want our first time offers to have, uh, so for like B2B, a common number that we use is $497. Because almost anybody in the organization can spend $500 and nobody's going to ask them about it. Uh, at least anybody who has any decision-making authority. And so... And the uh, money to make high ticket sales purchases. Yeah, right, exactly. And so we <clears throat> so we we try to pack five thousand dollars of value into a four hundred ninety seven dollar purchase. Um, the next thing is it has to solve a problem because if it's not solving a problem, it's not delivering value. And a common mistake I see people make when they try to put these together on their own, is they'll do an audit or an assessment or something like that. And the problem with that is all that does is that helps, that highlights the problems they have. It doesn't solve a problem. Yeah. And at least in my experience, there's a limited number of people in this world that want to invite me into their world to critique them. And so, so it has to solve a problem. Uh, but you don't want to solve the big problems or otherwise you won't sell your core offers. Mm -hmm. so it has to leave problems unsolved and it has to naturally lead to the next step that ultimately takes them to your core offer. And what we found is when you do that, and there's a couple other structural things we can talk about that when, when you have, when you design this just right, it builds insane levels of trust in very short periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the reasons is if you come side by side with somebody and help them solve a problem, that's going to build trust. Yeah. And it, and that's back to that Maya Angelou quote. That's back to how my wife made me feel versus how the doctors made me feel that you're in their court and that they can trust you. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just insanely powerful. Um, and then once you're there, you're no longer competing on price. You know, you, you, your price can't be ridiculous. But if your price is in the ballpark of your competitors, you're not going to lose the business on price. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, my mind's already spinning. <laughs> oh, I love these conversations because I'm like, that is so good. And I'm already thinking, okay, how am I implementing this? How am I going to implement this? Uh so can you can you give us some examples like maybe do you have um, either something you've done in your company or uh, do you have maybe a client that you can talk about like give an example of how that would work? Yeah, I'll give I'll, I'll tell you my favorite example is and the roots of it is I you know I used to go into the bank and I'd ask the teller, "Hey, you guys giving out free samples today?" And they kind of like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go away, you're annoying." Uh, but you know, I always had this vision of how do you do free samples of money? Well, we had a client. <laughs> yeah, who wouldn't take free samples of money, man, unless it's counterfeit. <laughs> right. Well, we had a client that was a 
um, that did commercial construction as a as an investment mechanism. So his customers were not really tenants. His customers were investors that wanted to invest into the project. And um, and typical project was like $40 million uh, valuation, post-build valuation. And we were, you know, we were looking at it and we we asked them, um, what's the lifetime value? This is a question. If 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 anybody calls us and talks to us for more than 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna ask them what's the lifetime value of your customers. And, and what mm -hmm. I found is most people don't know the answer to that. No worries, we help you kind of work through that. But it's an important question. And he said, you know, he kind of thought about it. He said, for us to bring a new investor on a project, it's worth $5 million to us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, their lifetime, we will get $5 million of value out of that investor. I go, okay. Well, if a new investor is worth $5 million to you, how much of that $5 million would you be willing to spend to acquire a new customer, a new you know, new investor? And he thought about it and he said, well, I think I'd be willing to spend a million. I'm like, okay. You know, and it's like, I think we can drive a bus through that door. And <laughs> Uh, yeah, if he'd said like fifteen dollars, that'd be a different story. <laughs> yeah, that's that's when the conversation ends for us because we've had that happen. It's funny, yeah. You know, people are like, oh, I don't want to spend anything. I'm like, okay, well, we're not the right ones for you. Mm -hmm. um, but the but when we started looking at uh, that and we started working through it, now I, I will tell you, any good first time offer has a minimum of three and maximum of five deliverables. And this one did as well, but the, the biggest deliverable was we looked at that $40 million pie and I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to slice off a half million dollars of special shares and divide those special shares into five blocks. Now their customers were, uh, were family office managers, basically mm -hmm. people who manage the finances for very, very wealthy people. And they didn't get to keep their job by putting their client's money in Vanguard or something like that. They had to find new and interesting investments, which would be people like my client. But of course, they want to be careful with their client's money. They don't want to give him a million dollars and then watch it frittered away. And so I said, how about this? Let's, let's divide up shares. Let's carve out half a million and make this offer. You go up to these new investors, say, look, you don't know us. We don't know you. We're looking to expand our pool of investors. And we have an opportunity for you, for you to find out what it's like to work with us. If you buy $50,000 worth of shares in this project, we will immediately match that investment with another $50,000. And so you can go back to your client and tell them that you doubled their money straight away. You don't know how this is going to work out, but at least the first step, you doubled their money. And there were some other deliverables that went along with that. But you see what it does. It, it, mm -hmm. it creates this irresistible offer of, you know, if you're managing a family office, you have to find new investment vehicles for your client. That's the, that's the problem. The pain is, I don't know where to put my client's money. Well, mm -hmm. here's a place to solve it on a small level of you can immediately double your client's money, you probably won't lose money. It would be really hard for you to lose money on this deal. So you'll coming out, come out looking like a shining knight and potentially have a new place to invest not only that client's money, but other clients' monies. And that will, um, and that will help you look good in front mm -hmm. of that. And so that's one example. Um, let me give you another example. This is not one that I did. And it's not exactly the type of client we would work with, but I think this, uh, oh yeah. And before I forget the big question I get when I explain that one is, well, who was paying for the $50,000, which was a question my client asked me, you know, the matching 50 K and I said, well, you have a, you have a marketing budget, right? He's like, yeah. So you're just moving, you know, ended up being like slightly more than half of 1% of the total project. Mm -hmm. like, you're just using that for marketing. That's just a marketing expense. But here, here's an example that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people can relate to. 
it's not one we put together, but I think it helps people understand. Years ago, there was a dumpy old hotel at the end of the Vegas Strip called uh, that, that got bought by a guy named Bob Stupak. And he called it Bob Stupak's Vegas World. <laughs> and he put out an offer saying, give me $396. I will give you three days and two nights in one of my luxury suites. Uh, there will be a bottle of champagne waiting for you when you arrive. All of your drinks while you're here are free, whether you're gambling or not. Even if you're say, sitting in one of our entertainment venues, you will pay nothing more for a drink. Not only that, but for your $396, I will give you $600 of chips to use in my casino. And so right there, we have a offer. Remember I said three to five? Yeah. That has four elements. The price of the hotel room was discounted off the published rate. So that was a bargain. Bottle of champagne, you know, probably worth you know 100 bucks or whatever, not, not the full 396. The free drinks, if you're if you're somebody that likes to drink, you know, that's a lot of drinking in Vegas. And and then the six hundred dollars in chips. And so if you're the type of person that likes to drink and gamble, this is just an insanely good offer that's hard to say no to. Uh, if you're like me, I I mean, I'll have some wine. I, I, I won't drink that much. I, and I don't like gambling. And I look at that, I'm like, eh, I think I'll speak yeah. somewhere else. Well, here's why that's important. Bob Stupak only had so many rooms in his hotel. And the way he maximized profit was by making sure that every room was filled with a gambler. Mm. But not me. So his offer rejected somebody like me because I was not profitable for him and attracted those who are most profitable for him. Well, yeah, because they're buying food and you go, they're going to blow through that $600 and continue to spend. So ultimately they make their money back. I, I love that. Now, Craig, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, I'm wondering, because um, we have like a lot of consultants, professionals, speakers, coaches, people that provide those types of services. Would you have an example that applied to them? Because I'm, I'm trying to think through, like, how do you do three to five deliverables in, in maybe a situation like that? Yeah. So for us, um, you know, one of the things we do is we help people build these offers. And our first engagement, this is up on our website, our first engagement with anybody is $497. We, we, we believe in that process. We don't want to get, we don't want to be too committed to somebody that may or may not be a fit. We don't want them to feel locked in with us if we're not a fit for them. And so uh, if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I want to build a first time offer, ultimately, where they're going to get the best working one is in a, a workshop with us because there's a lot of mistakes to be made and I've made most of them and, and, and learned from them. But the, you know, the first deliverable is we take an ideal client of theirs and we work with them. And this is a workshop part where we try to understand, um, we, we, identify how they transform someone's life across what they have, what they feel, what their average day is like, and their status. Because we believe very strongly you should sell the transformation, not the product or service. That's mm -hmm. why people used to wait in line to buy Apple products because Apple sold the transformation. Yes. So we help them, our first deliverable is we help them map out the messaging of the transformation that they provide. And we tell them, if you can transform someone's status, that's where you will always make the most amount of money. So that's the first deliverable. The second deliverable is even if you think you're selling one product or service, we could break it down into a whole bunch of smaller elements of you deliver a little bit of value here, a little bit of value here, a little bit of value here. And we map that onto a grid of um, top left quadrant is it removes an, an immediate pain, which is the easiest thing to sell. Uh, the next one is uh, top right is you avoid a future pain. Uh, bottom left is immediate gain. And the bottom right is future gain. Now, the hardest thing in the world to sell is future gain. And so yeah. if you have five consultants and what have you, that's what you're selling. And that's hard, especially in this economy. So what we do is we take all the things where you add value and we map it into those four different quadrants. And that starts painting the picture of where you're going to 
where, where we're going to find the ideas for your first time offer mm -hmm. is where you can remove immediate pain. That's the second deliverable. Uh, the third deliverable is we find some folks um, aren't able to, once they get a yes from the client, the amount of time it takes to put an invoice in their hands and get that paid is often too long. And so we benchmark that and where they, where they rank of you know, best in class or room for improvement. And we make recommendations for infrastructure to help them improve that time. Uh, that's the third deliverable. The fourth deliverable is one of the fears that people have if they do this is that people will see them as low value or desperate. That's never been our case. We've never struggled no. with that, uh, but that's a very real fear. And so what we do is we show them how to position their product uh, to be perceived as high value, even when they're selling a low, you know, low ticket first mm -hmm. offer. And we give them a custom positioning unique for their product. That's the fourth deliverable. And then lastly, the fifth deliverable is your current sales playbook doesn't work with first time offers. It has to be, it has to be changed. And we have a sales playbook that will close first time offers like butter. And, and so we will do that. You know, that's the fifth deliverable. So right there is a ton of value packed into $497. Yes, I can see that. I could see that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's just because most, most people listening more run service-based businesses. So, you know, I love the other examples, but I'm thinking, okay, how, how do you apply it, you know, in, in a in a different type of environment. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we are out of time, my friend. So what I would love for you to do, um, I know you have a, an off and a free offer for the uh, listeners today. So if you want to share that and then how can they connect with you if they've really enjoyed today's conversation? Yeah. So they can reach us at uh, reach me at my website. It's allies for me.com. That's A-L-L-I-E-S, the number four, M-E.com. And the the offer, the free gift that we have, uh, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, I fumbled around for about 18 months before I sort of got this thing working. And then over the last five years, have just perfected it beyond that. And so we have a guide to help you avoid some of the mistakes that I made. And I made a lot. Um, and we also have a 23 day access to our course, self-paced course, uh, that will help you start working on this. And the reason we limit it to 23 days is we've all signed up for free courses and never logged in to take advantage of that. We're in the business of changing lives. We want you to put this to work. So we put a limit on there and we found that that gets people in there actually using it. We mm -hmm. see it in the analytics. Um, and so the way you get that is you go to our website, alliesforme.com slash author to authority, all lowercase, all together. And that will take you to a page to sign up. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, Craig. Wow. I feel like we could continue this conversation for a long time, but unfortunately we have to end. So this has been Craig Andrews and Kim Thompson Pinder on the Author to Authority podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on the very next episode. Bye now.